My name is Drew Burdett, and I'm your new RUF pastor at Boise State. And I'll be leading us this morning in worship, preaching, and also right after the service, I'll have a little five-minute update, maybe a little bit of Q&A. So with that, would you please stand with me as we hear the call to worship from Psalm 91. Here is God calls us to worship. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that you do call us to worship you. We come into your presence, uh, not inviting you to come here, Lord, for you are already here. You are already at work um, all over your world and through your church, and you actually call us to come, and you invite us to come into your presence to worship you, to spend time honoring you, to, to give you glory. We thank you, Lord, for your holiness. We thank you that you are a God who is high and lifted up, a God who is the creator who makes all things and who invites us to come to you in worship. And Lord, we come to you, Lord, because you are a God who is also our refuge, our fortress. Lord, you are a God who is not only high and lifted up, but you are also a God who is close to the needy. You welcome the lonely, you welcome the afflicted, you welcome even sinners to come into your presence because you are a God who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And so this morning, Lord, I pray that as we come to worship, Lord, that this would be a time of refuge for us, that we would come into your presence and that you would use uh, your spirit and your word, Lord, to convict us, to encourage us, uh, to help us to grow in grace and to walk with you more faithfully every day. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. I told the, uh, the elders of the council this morning that uh, it's always difficult to lead a service that you've never been to. Uh, so it may be a little rusty, uh, but I promise we'll get you to the end. Uh, hear the Lord's greeting. This is from 2 Corinthians 13. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Uh, let us continue to worship by turning in the worship hymnal to 143. Jesus, draw me ever nearer.
pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. Lord, time and time again in your word, you tell us that you are a God who is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Lord, you call us to come to you, to know you, uh, to walk in your ways, to grow in your grace. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who condescends, a God who comes near to us and longs for us uh, to know you and to walk with you. And so this morning, Lord, we praise you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your welcome. And we thank you for uh, the Christ. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, our Old Testament reading is coming from Exodus 20. This is the giving of the Ten Commandments. And before we read it, I want to remind us that this law was given after the Lord had redeemed his people. He had rescued them from Egypt. He had brought them to himself. And he gives them uh, this law as a new way to live as his people. This is Exodus 20. We're reading verses 1 through 17. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, am the Lord, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he made it holy. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Let us respond by singing, Gracious God, My Heart Renew, number 16 in the worship hymnal. Thank you. 
couple of announcements before we uh, go before our Lord in congregational prayer. The first is there is choir practice um, after the service and after the presentation by uh, Reverend Burdett on RUF. So those who want to uh, sing in choir for Easter, uh, please join, I'm assuming, in front of church. Uh, the second is a note of thanks. Um, Craig Camper has a healthy grandson. Kevin and Lauren Camper had a baby boy on Friday. Brooks Finley uh, Camper. So uh, Thanksgiving for that for uh, Kevin and Lauren and the Camper family. And with that, um, please join me in congregational prayer. O oh Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. Next week, we recall when your son came into Jerusalem, humble and mounted on a donkey. But we look forward to the day when Christ returns on a white horse with eyes like flames of fire, the King of kings and Lord of lords. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Almighty eternal Lord God, you are creator and preserver of all things, both in heavens above and the earth below. There can be nothing better than to praise you, O Lord, and to declare your loving kindness on your holy and blessed Sabbath day. Here in your presence, Father, we confess our unworthiness to come before you to call upon your name. Our hearts are polluted and unclean. We beg your gracious favor to create in us clean hearts that are inclined towards you and to serving you by obeying your law. Our Father, who so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, we acknowledge and marvel at your mercy. Even while we were enemies, you reconciled us. Even while we were strangers, he made us co-heirs with Christ of all eternal blessings. Even while we stood condemned, you redeemed us. Even while we were imprisoned, you delivered us from the tyranny of sin, death, and the devil. Beneath the cross of Christ, we come to know that ours is a guilt, but yours is a forgiveness. Ours is a bondage, yours is the freedom of adoption and new obedience. We know that we are no longer slaves to sin because we are children of God. Therefore, we cry out to you in sorrow for our sins and thanksgiving for your gift of salvation. We confess that we are often fearful and tempted to look for fulfillment and security in other gods and things that promise to deliver but never do. Yet in your fatherly goodness, you have adopted us in Christ. We look to no other king, seek no other advocate for the help we need in this world and in the world to come. Gracious God, thank you for opening the eyes of our hearts and enabling us to see that in Christ you have given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Forgive us for the times that we allow other things to cloud our vision. <clears throat> Help us to look, live looking to Jesus so that we learn to view everything in the light of this reality, that from you and through you and to you are all things. Help us to deal with experiences of disappointment, defeat, and sadness those who have been reborn to a living hope by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for your benediction on your holy gospel, that it may be faithfully proclaimed and the world filled with the knowledge of your truth. Please send workers into your field to plant, water, and harvest a people for your name and establish your kingdom throughout the earth. We pray for the missionaries we support with our prayers and monies. We ask for peace in the country of Ukraine, that the evil torment and darkness be stopped. We pray for your ongoing heavily protection of the Hakka boards and the church in Lviv as they serve and minister to those displaced by the war. Be with the ribbons as they lead mission work in eastern and southern Africa to plant churches and to develop and equip congregations for mission and ministry. We pray that Christian witness is seen by others and that the good news of the gospel is shared and finds fertile soil to change hearts, lives, and communities as your church is built and your name is glorified. We think of Jason and Hannah as they serve. Watch over that family to keep them safe in their work. We think of Hannah as she is uh, pregnant and hopefully delivers a healthy uh, baby this summer. 
We pray for the work of Mint Seminary with the Doting Guns in Papua New, New Guinea to equip pastors and Christian workers to serve churches and communities. We pray for Reverend Burdett serving at Boise State Reform University Fellowship. We give thanks that this ministry continues to be strong on the campus and this organization is forming Christian community for children, uh, students to grow in their faith or come to faith in Christ. Help the students and other Christian colleges and colleges from this congregation to finish this semester well in their studies. We think of the work that Chrysalis is doing to fill the empty buckets from brokenness with living water that only Christ can provide through the work of the Spirit in the hearing the refreshing good news of the gospel for the women being served through that ministry. We pray for financial resources to find another house to serve more women looking for freedom as they transition from an imprisoned life. We think of the pro-life ministries and we think of the work that our legislators have in defending uh, pro-life and serving women who are considering emotion, uh, abortion. We pray that they choose life for that pregnancy or that their lives were affected by abortion, that they may hear the refreshing news of the gospel and, and uh, live a life glorifying to you. We think of love in the name of Christ and other ministries locally that we are partnering with. We think of MAF and all the work that they're doing uh, locally and abroad, uh, serving those uh, on the mission field, and that they may continue to serve in word and deed. We pray for those in our congregation who are undergoing treatment for cancer or other illnesses. We remember all those who are suffering from physical danger, temptation, doubts, illness of the mind or body, or financial hardship, and those who are near death. May the cross and resurrection of Christ, your Son, refresh them in their trials. Give them the grace to bear the difficulties you send them to bring them closer to you. Give us also the grace to share in their suffering, provide for their needs as we are able. Pray for those who are traveling and returning from spring break. They may safely return here to Boise as they continue their work and and to worship with us in, in body. Be with your church here at Cloverdale that we may be a loving congregation toward one another as we walk together in service to your glory. We ask for guidance and a spirit-led desire to serve for the men who are nominated to serve as church officers. Help this congregation to shine light in the darkness and reflect grace through our good works to our neighbors and coworkers. May we always be ready to share the reason for the hope we have in Christ in a gentle and respectful manner to leave the aroma of Christ behind in our interactions. Strengthen us through your means of grace that we may worship you not only with our words, but also our lives, and build us up into one body, a city in the world whose light cannot be hidden. May each of us, we pray, make us a living sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving pleasing to you. In your son's holy name, Jesus Christ, we pray this all. Amen. We now have the opportunity to give back to with what the Lord has richly given us. The first offering is a building fund, and the second offering is a general fund.
pray together. Lord, we know that all good gifts come from you. You are, God who, you are a God who is gracious, a God who gives us all things. And so, Lord, I pray that as we respond in worshiping you by giving of our tithes and offerings, Lord, that you would use these, um, that you would see these as, as gifts from our heart and praise and in worship of you. And, Lord, that you would take these gifts and that you would use them for your kingdom, that you would grow your kingdom here in Boise and around the world. And so we thank you for this. In Christ's name, amen. Would you stand as we prepare our hearts uh, to hear his word by singing the secret place, number, number 30.
seated. Our scripture reading this morning is from Mark chapter 9. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 13. And this is on page 1074 in your pew Bibles. Mark 9, starting with verse 2. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, Why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man, that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it was written of him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning that we can gather together and spend time listening to your word. I pray that you would give us uh, hearts ready to receive it, the ears ready to hear, and eyes ready to see the things that you have for us in your word. So speak to us this morning uh, through this passage in Mark. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's good to be with you all uh, here at Cloverdale. Uh, Thank you so much for your Christmas gift to our family. Uh, That was a blessing to us. One of the things you gave us was a Uh, Through the Ribbons was a a birdhouse. We put it up this week. Uh, We're really excited to see what comes of that. So it's been a really a joy to partner with you in ministry uh, and to already begin to build that relationship. I know this is my first time here, and whenever I preach at a church for the first time, uh, always several people will come forward, and they always ask me the same question, and it is, where are you from? Uh, And if they think they know where I'm from, they may say, where are you from, boy? Uh, And to those folks, I say Southern Canada. Uh, just to throw them off a little bit, but everybody else, I confess that I am from, um, I'm not from around here, I am from the South, I'm from South Carolina, uh, and one of the, the interesting things about growing up in South Carolina, as I did in a rural community in the early 90s, is that nobody ever played soccer. Um, nobody played, I don't think I saw a soccer ball there, uh, it, was, it wasn't until I was in the 10th grade that I knew that people actually played soccer here in the U.S., and I was completely ignorant and happily ignorant about soccer. Until about a decade ago, I moved to Seattle, and it seemed like everybody played soccer or watched soccer or did something to do with soccer. Uh, And a few years after moving there, the World Cup happened, and uh, some of the Seattle Sounders played on the U.S. team. And so everybody, the whole city was excited about this game. Everybody was talking about it. People were taking off work to go see this game. And so I thought, well, I don't really want to miss out. So I guess I should try to watch this game so I can be able to talk to people about uh, the U.S.-Germany game. But I didn't have ESPN, which is where the game was played, and so I started flipping through my channels, and I finally found the game on Desportes, which is the Spanish ESPN channel. And here's what I learned that day, was that apparently, even though I took five classes of Spanish in college, apparently I'm as equally ignorant in Spanish as I am in soccer. I was completely uh, confused. And without a commentator explaining like, in my language everything that was happening, I was completely lost. Nothing made sense. It was just a bunch of men running around, occasionally dramatically falling down. And so after 15 minutes of this, I just turned the TV off, thought this is useless, and went on my way. You know, sometimes when we read the Bible, there are particular, particular stories that feel that way. You read a passage, and you think, Without somebody explaining this to me, like word for word, breaking this down, I have no idea what is happening. It makes no sense. And then you shut the Bible, and you walk away and go find something else that does make sense. And the story of the transfiguration that we just read from Mark 9 is easily one of those stories. It's confusing. 
Uh, Jesus is transfigured. What does that mean? Nobody in this room used that word this week. And there's these figures from the distant past, people who had already died. You have Moses, you have Elijah, who show up in the present. It would be like Abraham Lincoln or George Washington showing up today. What is that about? Right? Even the disciples, Peter, James, and John, they are completely confused. But thankfully for us, God shows up and he runs commentary on what is happening in the transfiguration. He says, in case you missed it as we read it, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. This is what the transfiguration is all about, that Jesus is the beloved son of God, and as the beloved son of God, we are called to listen to him. And so as we walk through this passage this morning, I want to take our cue from God that this is what this passage is about, and I want to ask two questions. The first question is, okay, why listen to Jesus? What is it about Jesus that warrants this response? And then secondly, what does it even mean to listen to Jesus? Okay, why listen to Jesus? You know, there are a lot of voices that are constantly calling for us to listen to them, to follow them at any time, right? We live in a time when you can read four or listen to four different takes of the exact same historical event, and depending on which news story you listen to, you're going to have totally different information. Right? With, social me- with social media, regardless of which platform you use, whether that's Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, doesn't matter, whatever it may be, everybody now has a platform. Everybody now has a voice. Everybody now has a brand, and they're calling for you to listen to them. They're putting out their own ideas. And then we have our own lived experience and our own ideas that are talking to us all the time. And so we, we live in this, in this world where we might have multiple ideologies, multiple worldviews floating around us, floating inside of us at all times, calling for us to listen to them. And so with all of that noise, with all of those voices, the question is, what is it about Jesus? What is so special about him that would warrant that we listen to him and not any of the other voices whether they come from within or without? That is a legitimate question. And the disciples were also struggling with that same question. Let me give you a little background, a little context for this passage. You may have noticed in verse 2 it said, six days later. Right, six days before the transfiguration, something important happened. Peter and the other disciples were struggling to listen to something that Jesus had to say. And the reason they were struggling is because they did not like what Jesus was saying. Our context is obviously Mark 8, and Jesus, it's kind of the climax of Mark. It's been, we've been, Mark has been working up to chapter 8, the whole entire book, and Jesus has been discussing with his disciples what he has come to do. And everybody has agreed that Jesus is the Christ. Now, we have to remember that Christ is not Jesus' last name, right? It is a position, it's a title, and as such, it needs to be defined. What does it mean that he's the Christ? And so Jesus immediately begins to teach them what it means that he is the Christ. And here's what he says. This is chapter 8, verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. Now what Jesus is doing in this passage, in his teaching, is he's taking two prominent Old Testament characters and he is conflating them together as one position that describes who he is as the Christ. Right? One of them was somebody that everybody got excited about, the great and powerful Son of Man from Daniel chapter 7. This guy was, was uh, promised to come and usher in a kingdom that would have no end, and everybody was excited for him to come. Everybody was looking for him to come. The other, though, was the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Right? The Son of Man must suffer. The guy from the suffering servant from Isaiah 53 is a man of sorrows who would be acquainted with grief. He was one who would be wounded for the transgression of others and who would suffer greatly for their salvation. So Jesus takes these two Old Testament characters, he conflates them together as his blueprint or his job description for who he would be as the Christ. And nobody had ever done this. This is completely unique to Jesus as he is describing what the position of Christ would be. And this was not the norm. This was not what everybody was expecting. And so Peter hears what Jesus has to say, but he refuses to listen to him. 
And so he takes Jesus aside and he rebukes him for saying such nonsense. That is the context of the transfiguration. Peter, the disciples, struggling to listen to Jesus because they do not like what he has to say. Now, while we're probably not in the habit of rebuking Jesus, we also know how hard it can be to actually listen to him. Because he, he says hard things. He says things like, pick up your cross and follow me. Or he who would save his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. Those are hard things to listen to. He also says things that are, are difficult for us to accept. We know our shame. We know our guilt. We believe those. It's hard to hear you're forgiven. It's hard to listen to him when he says, I love you. Why should we listen to Jesus? Well, the transfiguration helps. How? The, transfigur the transfiguration of Jesus reveals two things. On one hand, it reveals his great power. And on the other hand, it reveals his great compassion. And if we're going to listen to Jesus, we have to hold both of these things together. Let's start with his power and look with me again at verses 2 through 7. After six days, from Peter's rebuke, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and he led them up a high mountain by himself, by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Let me walk through the details of the story, maybe fill in a few gaps. Right, the story begins with Jesus taking his inner circle, his three best friends, Peter, James, and John, on this, uh, on this hike to go pray. It says they go up a high mountain. And for some reason, whenever I read high mountain in the Bible, I just assume slightly large hill. Uh, so I looked it up this time. And apparently most scholars believe that given the area that Jesus was in, that the best candidate for this high mountain that Jesus takes uh, these three men on is actually Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon was 9,232 feet high, uh, which that still does not mean anything to me. Uh, but the parking lot at Bogus is 6,000 feet. And so if Boise is around close to 3,000 feet, take driving from Boise to Bogus and then do that again, and you get close to 9,000 feet. It's about the same height as Mount St. Helens was before it uh, erupted. There's currently a ski lodge on top of Mount Hermon. So they're going on a hike. This is a high mountain. And sometime during this hike, as they're, as they're going up this high mountain, Jesus is transfigured, which means that he has changed some way. Mark says that his, his clothes become radiant. They're intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. Somehow his clothes become heavenly clothes that are bright, shining white. Luke would say, uh, in his account of the gospel, that Jesus' face was altered. He looked different. Matthew uh, says that his face actually shone like the sun. And so he's glowing, he's radiating. And then Moses and Elijah show up. And we don't know how they knew that there was Moses and Elijah. I don't know if they were wearing name tags, uh, or if there was a meet and greet before, I don't know. But it's Moses and Elijah. And these are, these are Old Testament heroes. Right? Moses is the uh, implied author of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. Uh, he was a savior in some ways of Israel. He delivers, de delivers Israel from Egypt. He has his own uh, high mountain experience in Mount Sinai. Then you have Elijah. Elijah is one of the, the greatest prophets. He also delivered Israel from the worship of Baal. He also has a Mount Sinai experience. And so you can put yourself in Peter's shoes uh, Peter, James, and John, right? This would have been a big day for them, right? These were their heroes. If you'd ask them, who do you want to meet in heaven, or who would you like to get stuck on an elevator with? They probably would have said, Moses and Elijah would be pretty fun. Right? These are the men who taught them the words of God. These are the men they grew up studying, memorizing, following them as leaders. They saw them as their guides for life. And so Peter has his all-star lineup 
right in front of him. He's got Peter. He's got Moses. He's got Elijah. He's got Jesus. He's probably thinking, like, maybe Moses and Elijah can teach Jesus what this Christ thing is all about, right? They've got, he wants to build some tents for them. He's probably thinking, deliverance is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. Everything is ready. And then that cloud comes. It overshadows them. And God interrupts Peter and he teaches us how to understand this event. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Not Moses. Not Elijah. Jesus. Now, as you hear the story, you may be thinking like, this sounds remotely familiar. Is there another place in the Bible where a story like this happens? And yes, there is. The reason for that is that there are a lot of parallels between this passage and the transfiguration and a passage you may have read about in Exodus 34 with Moses on Mount Sinai. There's a lot of parallels, right? Obviously, Moses is there. Uh, He goes up onto a mountain, Mount Sinai. God shows up in a cloud and begins to speak out of the cloud. And when Moses comes down off of the mountain, his face is, is, is glowing, right? He's reflecting the glory of the Lord. And there is a lot of parallels between these two stories, but there's one glaring difference that is incredibly important. The difference is the timing. Moses' face shines and glows after he has been in the presence of God. He's reflecting God's glory. Not with Jesus. Jesus is actually radiating, shining, before God shows up in the cloud, right? Moses' face was not changed. He was simply reflecting the glory of God as a full moon glows and reflects the light of the sun. But Jesus, when he is transfigured, it's almost like he pulls back. He pulls back the cloak for a second and gives us a glimpse of who he truly is. Light was radiating out of him like the sun itself. The glory of God was emanating from him. Because Jesus was its source. But why is this important? Well, here's how the transfiguration reveals Jesus' great power. It reveals to us that Jesus is not an ordinary human being like you and me. He's not even a great human being like Moses and Elijah. He is actually God Almighty in the flesh. And this has always been one of the core uh, beliefs of Christians. One of our creeds puts it this way, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, the same essence of the Father. And what we see in the transfiguration is one moment where Jesus actually pulls back the cloak and he shows us his true nature, who he truly is, that he is God in the flesh. Which means that when you put him up against other voices, there is no one who is more competent, there is no one who is more worthy of trust because he is the source of all truth itself. When Jesus speaks, it is not an opinion piece. It is truth. And so the transfiguration reveals Jesus' great power, and we need that if we're going to listen to Jesus, but that's not enough. The transfiguration also reveals to us Jesus' great compassion. Look at verse 8. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. Right? When the cloud and the famous people and the, the radiant clothes go away, the glory of God and the cloud goes away, there's Jesus. And here's what his disciples had to wrestle with. Here's what they had to put together. Is it, okay, Jesus is the beloved Son of God. He is full of power and greatness. He is greater than Moses. He is greater than Elijah. But he is also their friend. He's also their teacher. He's the one who gave them nicknames, right? The Rock or Sons of Thunder. He prayed with them. He fed them. He listened to them. He lived with them each and every day. They saw him welcome tax collectors and sinners. 
Instead of shunning those who were unclean, whether it was through a disease like leprosy or whether it was through some other way, he didn't shun them, he actually healed them. He touched them. Instead of becoming unclean himself, he actually made them clean. He brought sight to the blind. He was powerful, yes, but he was also approachable. He was also compassionate. He was also kind. He was meek, and he was lowly. And those who were hurting, those who were broken, those who were afflicted, those who had disease, those who were sent to the margins of society, he welcomed them to himself. I mean, the mere fact that Jesus, who is fully God, is actually standing on this mountain with Peter, the one who rebuked him less than a week before, shows his compassion. It shows how low that he is willing to come to rescue those who deeply need him. And so the transfiguration does, does show us his power, but it also shows us his compassion. And this keeps with a theme that we find over and over again in the New Testament. That Jesus is not just able to save, he's also willing. In Matthew 11, Jesus describes his own heart this way. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. In his book that takes its title from this passage, Gentle and Lowly, Dane Ortland, he sees this passage in some ways as a, an unveiling as well. Just as the transfiguration is a breaking in and we see his, his essence of who Jesus is, in this passage, Jesus opens up and shows us his heart. Listen to what he has to say. In the one place in the Bible where the Son of God pulls back the veil and lets us peer down into the core of who He is, we are not told that He is austere and demanding in heart. We are not told that He is exalted and dignified in heart. We are not even told that He is uh, joyful and generous in heart. Letting Jesus set the terms, His surprising claim is that He is gentle and lowly in heart. So what is it about the transfiguration that warrants that we should listen to Jesus? It's his amazing power that is coupled with his great compassion that leads us to listen to him. And we need both of these. You know, I can't read the story of the transfiguration without thinking about Gandalf the Grey and Bilbo Baggins. I don't know if you're, friend, or if you're fans of, of Tolkien, but in their first book of the Fellowship of the Rings, there's this great scene where Bilbo Baggins, he's turning 111 years old, he throws a birthday party, and he has this, uh, he has this ring. It's a magical ring, and uh, it's his most prized possession that he owns. And the ring has a couple of things that is magical about it. One is it's given him great health. That's why he's 111 uh, and doing well. But it also, if he slips it on his, ringer, right, on his finger, he, uh, he disappears. And so at his 111th birthday party, uh, he has made a plan that he's going to go out with a bang. He's going to tell them he's going to disappear. He's going to sl slide the ring on his finger. He's going to disappear in front of their eyes. And then he is going to head out of town. And they'll all be wondering what happened to Bilba. And so he does it. He slides his ring on his finger. He heads up to his hobbit hole. He grabs up his bags. But right before he can leave, there's this knock at the door. He opens the door. And Gandalf the Grey, the wizard, right, pokes his head into the door. And apparently the two of them had made arrangements that when he went away, that he would leave the ring, his most prized possession, to his nephew Frodo. And so Gandalf says, hey, I so see you're leaving. Where's the ring? And he says, oh, it's on the mantle. He looks at the mantle and it's not there. And he reaches into his pocket and he says, oh, actually, it's here in my pocket. And Bilbo puts his hand in his pocket and he begins to hold the ring, the thing that he wants more than anything in life. And he says, now that it comes to it, I don't think I can part with it. Which means, I cannot listen to you, Gandalf. Right? Gandalf had told him to leave the ring. He says, I cannot do it. They argue back and forth. To eventually, Bilbo gets so angry that he grabs his little tiny sword and he's willing to fight off huge Gandalf the Grey. And Gandalf responds, it will be my turn to be angry soon and you will see Gandalf the Grey uncloaked. And I love how the movie uh, depicts this. As he says those words, Gandalf just grows in size. 
He fills up the whole hobbit hole. There's uh, the thunder roars. There's streaks of lightning. And you see his great power. And then as, mean, as soon as you see the power, he dwindles back down. And he's the same old man who was a friend of Bilbo. And he says, but I'm your friend, not your enemy. I've come not to rob you, but to help you. And it's in that moment when, when Bilbo saw both the power of the one he was up against and the compassion of him that he took the ring, the thing that he loved most in the world, he drops it on the floor and he walks out of the room. And the same is true for us in Jesus. Because when we follow Jesus, he's going to ask us to give away sometimes or to do things that are hard for us. Maybe our most prized possession in the world. And if we're going to listen to him, we have to see both his power and his compassion. And in the beauty of the incarnation is that Jesus is different than anybody else that we will ever meet. He is both full of power and strength and dignity and wisdom, and yet he is also slow to anger, abounded in mercy, present with us when we fail. He describes himself as gentle and lowly in heart, and there is nobody like Jesus. There's nobody like him. There's no one who warrants our undivided attention. And so as we think towards application here, as we begin to wrap up in some ways, that's why we should listen to him. But what does that even mean? What does it mean to listen to Jesus? And there's a lot of things we could say. Obviously, you've got to hear what he has. You have to hear what he's saying. You have to spend time in his word and those things. But I want to talk about where does listening begin and then where does it end, right? How do we know that we're starting to listen and where does listening take us? Right, listening begins when we respond to what Jesus says. And the key word there is respond. Uh, I have benefited from counselors who've told me there's a big difference between reacting and responding, right? You know the difference? Like reacting is when uh, someone says to you, hey, I think you were a jerk to the server. And uh, do we react or do we, or do we respond? Right? Reacting is when we say, well, I think you're a jerk for blah, 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 or we blow it off and say, ah, you don't know what you're talking about. That's just reacting. Responding is when we say, okay, why do you think that? Right? You may not yet agree with them, but listening begins when we respond. Right? We know that we're beginning to listen to Jesus when we've at least stopped reacting, not dismissing or rejecting, but we've started to respond to his word. And this is what the disciples do when they are hiking back down the mountain with Jesus. I want to read verses 9 through 13 as we see them beginning to listen. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And then they asked him, Why did the scribes say first that Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things, and how is it written in the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it was written of him. As they're walking down this mountain, a lot of amazing things have just happened, and yet Jesus brings them right back to the conversation that he had with them a week before, the conversation that he got rebuked for. He begins to talk to them about the Son of Man, who must be raised from the dead. And here's what we see the, the disciples do. Peter does not rebuke him this time. Instead of rebuking Jesus, they listen to him. Now, they don't fully agree with him yet, but we see they're listening with their pondering these things in their hearts, not rebuking, not rejecting, but beginning to slowly uh, uh, engage with him. We see this in their talk about Elijah, right? This has brought up a lot of questions for them. And so they start asking Jesus questions. And Jesus responds to them, but he keeps pressing them back to the main point that he wants them to know, and it's who he is as the Christ. He keeps bringing them back again to his suffering and death. And we see that they're beginning to listen, right? This is the beginning, is responding. Do you do this with God's word? Right? When you find something in God's Word that is difficult, that is hard for you to listen to, do you avoid it? Do you dismiss it? Uh, do you become defensive? Or do you start with responding? Okay, are you curious? 
Are you open to understanding more of what Jesus has to say? That's what listening, that's how listening begins. It begins with response. Where does it end? It ends with accepting his word as truth. A few years ago, I was uh, flying home from an RAF training, and I was sitting in the airport and just waiting to get on, and I'm always a little bit nervous when I fly, and so I hear over the, loud, over the intercom speakers my name, right? Driver that, please come to the ticket counter. And so I'm like, oh, no, I'm not making it home today. And so I go to the ticket counter, and they just said, oh, you got a new ticket. So they handed me my ticket, uh, took the one I had. And so I was relieved. I went and sat back down. And then they started uh, calling people to get up and go into the plane. So I thought, I need to find out what group I'm in. And I looked down, uh, and the ticket they gave me was 1B. And I realized that I got bumped to first class. And this had never happened to me before, and I was totally unprepared for it. And so I got up, and I walked onto the plane thinking, this surely can't be right. They took my ticket, and they're like, welcome, welcome aboard, Mr. Burdett. And so I went, and I sat down in 1B, and I was incredibly uncomfortable. I was so uncomfortable because I was looking around at everybody else in first class, and I thought, I bet they know. I bet they know that I didn't pay for this ticket. <laughs> like, they look at me, and they think, that guy deserves to be at the back of the plane, not up here with us. And so I thought, okay, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going I'm to, I, I want the back of the plane experience. Right, the flight attendant came by and she was like, "Can I get you something to drink?" And I was like, "No, no, no." Like, no, no, no nothing for me right now. You know, I was thinking, I was thinking, like, well, you know what? Bring me some water, but wait till I fall asleep. You know, run over my foot with that cart you've got. Like, I want the full like back of back of the plane. You know, I'm not going to take advantage of this because even though I had the ticket, like, I didn't feel like I was really first class quality. Um, but then I thought, this is ridiculous. Right? I have the ticket. It has my name on it. Nobody knows whether I paid for this or not. And so I thought, like, did you mention something about a drink? And it was the best flight I'd ever had. It was wonderful to be up with all that room. Right? I finally accepted the reality. And this is where listening ends up. Right? It begins with responding where we're curious about what Jesus has to say. But we haven't really listened until we've accepted it as truth, or we may say we've assimilated the news into our lives. Now you can think about if you were to travel right now uh, to, the, to, to Oregon, you could pick up an old map, maybe from the Oregon Trail, and you can say, okay, here's where, go, here's where we're going. Uh, and that would be a bad plan, right? Because there's new roads that have been built. Assimilating that new news is when you see the new map and you think, oh, okay, this is the way that I'm going now. I'm going to accept this as the right way. And that's what listening looks like. We haven't listened until we've actually accepted it, assimilated it into our lives and will act differently. And we see this in the disciples' lives, but not overnight. Peter did not get this right away. It took a while for him to understand and accept who Jesus was as the Christ. But if you fast forward 30 years and you look at his first letter, the letter of 1 Peter, you can hear the words of Jesus in the words of Peter. I want to read you just a short passage from 1 Peter. This is verses 21 through 24. And what you're going to hear is Peter riffing off of Isaiah 53, the passage that he had rebuked Jesus for using 30 years before. Here's what he has to say about Jesus the Christ. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But entrusting himself to him who judges justly, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. He got there. The end goal of listening is accepting what Jesus says is truth and then living that out in reality. And so as you think about your own heart, maybe you're thinking about the things maybe that you have been avoiding in his word or the things that you have just dismissed. What would it look like for you to listen to him? You know, is there anything about Jesus, about who he is or what he's come to do or how he wants us to grow or change that you have not listened to? What if you began by responding today? What if you began to be curious what if you began to move towards accepting it as truth? Right, why listen to Jesus? He is the powerful son of man of Daniel 7 who comes in power and glory, who has ushered in a kingdom that has no end. 
And he is also the compassionate suffering servant of Isaiah 53. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. And discipleship, those who would look to follow Jesus, it looks like embracing Jesus. It looks like being curious. It looks like sitting at his feet and learning to listen to all that he says. In your, in your list of voices that I will listen to, you will find nobody else as competent or as compassionate. And that includes your own either inner fan or inner critic. Only Jesus is able and willing to save. I want to end with the first and last verse of a great hymn called Come Ye Sinner. You can hear this, this language of power and, and compassion coming together. Come ye sinners, poor and wretched, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stand, stands to save you. Full of pity, joined with power. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. And then it ends, lo, the incarnate God ascended pleads the merit of his blood. Venture on him, venture wholly, let no other trust intrude. None but Jesus, none but Jesus can do helpless sinners good. As God said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to you, If we're honest, there's a lot in our hearts, there's a lot in our lives that make listening to you difficult. But often, Lord, maybe we don't think that you're right. We don't think that your way is truth or is good. Help us to see your power. Help us to see the reality of who you are. Sometimes, Lord, we have a hard time listening because we don't believe that you're good, that you are compassionate and gracious, that what you want for us is not meant to hurt us. Lord, help us to see your compassion. Lord, I pray that as we, as we learn the difficult skill of listening to you, that you would show us your power and your grace. Lord, that you would inspire us, that you would grow us, that we would long to love you and know you and walk in your ways, that we would see you as beautiful as unique, that no one on earth is like you. Help us, Lord, as we struggle to walk with you. Help us to see your grace and mercy and power. Help us to respond and even to accept the things that you've taught us in your word and through your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please uh, stand with me as we respond using number 480, I Have No Other Comfort.
Just a quick reminder, right after the doxology, we're going to sit and I'm going to have a brief update on RUF. Hear now the Lord's blessing over you, His good word that He speaks over His people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious towards you. The Lord lift up His countenance unto you and grant you His peace. Let's close with to God be the glory.